Our next reading will be two weeks from tonight. Short story writer Kent Nelson will be reading in the Terrace Lounge. That's April 6th. The next reading at Pima College will be Tuesday, April 11th, and the reader is Tom Cobb, reading from his poetry. We have available tonight some flyers concerning a new literary magazine, Persona. We'll have them over at the reception for Miss Glick, and there's a stack of them up here on the stage. This is a literary magazine with funds made available from the Publications Board. It is for undergraduate university students only. The deadline for submissions for the first issue is April 1st. And it's not only poetry, but short fiction, essays, graphics, and photographs. There will be a poetry reading tomorrow night at El Pueblo Community Center at 6th and Irvington, beginning at 7.30. Some of the readers are Miriam Bornstein Somosa and Marina Rivera of our Modern Languages, um, Romance Languages Department. It will be a Spanish and English reading, and it's followed by a dance, and it's free. Louise Glick comes to us most recently from Cincinnati, where she's just completed a 10-week special seminar. She's also been associated with and is continuing to be associated with Goddard College in Vermont, where Vermont is her home. She's also taught at Iowa, the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown. She has three collections of poetry, Firstborn, The House on Marshland, and most recently, The Garden. Her work appears in all of the standard poetry magazines, such as American Poetry Review, Antaeus, Iowa Review, and many others. We've been longing to have her here for five years. We first invited her to come five years ago, and she was having a baby then and put us off until this year. We're very happy to have her here. <laughs> she put the baby off. She just put us off. <laughs> Louise Glick. Well, I've gotten better and better over that time, so you're luckier. I'm going to read new work, which is to say poems written since this last book. Uh, I should say about the garden that it's a chapbook. It's really just one poem bound in green for Easter. Um, can you hear me in the back? Okay. There's not too much I can do to raise my voice because I really am sick. So if you can't hear it, you should move more forward. The Blind Girl. When I was ten, God sent two arrows meant for my eyes. Two arrows, two capsules of snow that shattered so the bandage froze to my face. When they took it off, I was blind. Nurse, how strange the darkness is, not black at all, but the passive color of absence, as though one afternoon an image came of autumn, of a garden where all color had converged to fade and faded and was not replaced. I listened. I heard voices. I heard my own voice rising from the still transparent body of an angel as calmly as the wind lifts the edges of the curtains, letting in 
the measured light The next poem is called The Garden. It is uh, the entirety of that chapbook. Five poems, each with its own title. The Fear of Birth. One sound, then the hiss and whir of houses gliding into their places and the wind leafs through the bodies of animals. But my body that could not content itself with health, why should it be sprung back into the cord of sunlight? It will be the same again, this fear, this inwardness, until I am forced into a field without immunity, even to the least shrub that walks stiffly out of the dirt, trailing the twisted signature of its root, even to a tulip, a red claw, and then the losses, one after another, all supportable. The garden. The garden admires you. For your sake, it smears itself with green pigment, the ecstatic reds of the roses, so that you will come to it with your lovers. And the willows, see how it has shaped these green tents of silence, yet there is still something you need, your body so soft, so alive among the stone animals. Admit that it is terrible to be like them beyond harm. The fear of love. That body lying beside me like obedient stone. Once its eyes seemed to be opening, we could have spoken. At that time, it was winter already. By day, the sun rose in its helmet of fire, and at night also mirrored in the moon. Its light passed over us freely, as though we had lain down in order to leave no shadows, only these two shallow dents in the snow. And the past, as always, stretched before us, still, complex, impenetrable. How long did we lie there, as arm in arm in their cloaks of feathers, the gods walked down from the mountain we built for them? Origins. as though a voice were saying, you should be asleep by now. But there was no one, nor had the air darkened, though the moon was there, already filled in with marble. As though in a garden crowded with flowers, a voice had said, how dull they are, these golds, so sonorous, so repetitious, until you closed your eyes, lying among them all stammering flame, 
and yet you could not sleep. Poor body, the earth still clinging to you. The fear of burial. In the empty field, in the morning, the body waits to be claimed. The spirit sits beside it on a small rock. Nothing comes to give it form again. Think of the body's loneliness. At night, pacing the sheared field, its shadow buckled tightly around. Such a long journey. And already, the remote, trembling lights of the village, not pausing for it as they scan the rows. How far away they seem. The wooden doors, the bread and milk laid like weights on the table. Here's a poem about a photograph. It's called Portland, 1968. You stand as rocks stand to which the sea reaches in transparent waves of longing. They are marred finally. Everything fixed is marred and the sea triumphs like all that is false, all that is fluent and womanly. From behind, the lens opens for your body. Why should you turn? It doesn't matter who the witness is, for whom you are suffering, for whom you are standing still. I was talking a bit today in Barbara Anderson's class about the way in which, or a way in which, my poetry changed when I became a parent. And what I said then was that I started to see in objects that had hitherto been innocent and incapable of working harm a capacity um, for devastation, uh, stairs, objects on a table, corners, things that you could fall off of, things that could come down on you. The whole world changes. Um, and I discovered that I was writing poems of peril, the peril that the world can be to children. and. Some of these poems were fairly general, and others more particular to my own history, I found opened up to me uh, a part of that history I would not yet felt called to. Um, I had a sister who died before I was born uh, at nine days old. Uh, it would seem that as losses go, that wouldn't be too hard to bear. I wasn't, after all, there when it happened. But there was a way in which my family formed around her absence. Um, I'd like to read a series of poems, three poems, uh, written about my sister. And then uh, I'll read several more about children in general. This poem, like the garden, has one title and then titles for the individual poems, and the single title is Descending Figure. The only thing I think you need to know is that the middle section describes a painting.
the wanderer. At twilight, I went into the street. The sun hung low in the iron sky, ringed with cold plumage. If I could write to you about this emptiness, along the curb, groups of children were playing in the dry leaves. Long ago, at this hour, my mother stood at the lawn's edge holding my little sister. Everyone was gone. I was playing in the dark street with my other sister whom death had made so lonely. Night after night, we watched the screened porch filling with a gold magnetic light. Why was she never called? Often, I would let my own name glide past me, though I craved its protection. The Sick Child A small child is ill, has wakened. It is winter, past midnight in Antwerp. Above a wooden chest, the stars shine, and the child relaxes in her mother's arms. The mother does not sleep. She stares fixedly into the bright museum. By spring, the child will die. Then it is wrong, wrong to hold her. Let her be alone, without memory, as the others wake, terrified, scraping the dark paint from their faces. For my sister. Far away, my sister is moving in her crib. The dead ones are like that, always the last to quiet. Because however long they lie in the earth, they will not learn to speak, but remain uncertainly pressing against the wooden bars, so small, the leaves hold them down. Now, if she had a voice, the cries of hunger would be beginning. I should go to her. Perhaps if I sang very softly, her skin so white, her head covered with black feathers, Portrait. A child draws the outline of a body. She draws what she can, but it is white all through. She cannot fill in what she knows is there. Within the unsupported line, she knows that life is missing. She has cut one background from another. Like a child, she turns to her mother, and you draw the heart against the emptiness she has created.
This is the sort of poem I meant not to write many of, in which uh, you see the son of the poet in uh, adorable attitudes. There are three parts. It's called Illuminations. There's a reach. I'll pause between the sections. My son stands in the snow, in his blue snowsuit. All around him stubble, the brown degraded bushes. In the morning air, they seem to stiffen into words. And between the white, steady silence, a wren hops on the airstrip under the sill, drills for sustenance, then spreads its short wings, shadows dropping from them. Last winter, he could barely speak. I moved his crib to face the window. In the dark mornings, he would stand and grip the bars until the walls appeared calling light, light, that one syllable in demand or recognition. He sits at the kitchen window with his cup of apple juice. Each tree forms where he left it, leafless, trapped in his breath. How clear their edges are no limb obscured by motion as the sun rises cold and single over the map of language. The Drowned Children You see, they have no judgment, so it is natural that they should drown. First the ice taking them in, and then all winter, their wool scarves floating behind them as they sink, until at last they are quiet, and the pond lifts them in its manifold dark arms. But death must come to them differently, so close to the beginning, as though they had always been blind and weightless. Therefore, the rest is dreamed. The lamp, the good white cloth that covered the table, their bodies, and yet, they hear the names they used, like lures slipping over the pond. What are you waiting for? Come home, come home, lost in the waters, blue and permanent. This poem is called The Dream of Morning. Morning in the title is spelled M-O-U-R-N, ing. When the word occurs in the poem, it's the other morning when you wake up. <coughs> it's very consoling to come to Arizona and hear people coughing. I mean, there's no other audience that would like to hear cough. <laughs> Something about the illusion of perfect health that's <laughs> distressing to the chronic invalid. Do it, do it!
The dream of morning. I sleep so you will be alive. It is that simple. The dreams themselves are nothing. They are the sickness you control, nothing more. I rush toward you in the summer twilight, not in the real world, but in the buried one where you are waiting as the wind moves over the bay, toying with it, forcing thin ridges of panic. And then the morning comes, demanding prey. Remember? And the world complies. Last night was different. Someone fucked me awake. When I opened my eyes, it was over. All the pain gone by which I knew my life. And for one instant, I believed I was entering the stable dark of the earth and thought it would hold me. I don't have many love poems. Um, for the reason you would guess. But, <clears throat> well, I hope to have more. <laughs> Here's one. This is one uh, that started out, this was one of those exquisite romances that is exquisite partly because it's going to end immediately. Um, It's called Obad, Dawn Song. It's sort of like alarm clock. Today above the gull's call, I heard you waking me again to see that bird flying so strangely over the city, not wanting to stop, wanting the blue waste of the sea. Now it skirts the suburb, the noon light violent against it. I feel its hunger as your hand inside me, a cry so common, unmusical. Ours were not different. They rose from the unexhausted need of the body, presuming a wish to return, the ashen dawn, our clothes not sorted for departure. <coughs> the next is, I suppose, more typical. It's called the mirror. Watching you in the mirror, I wonder what it is like to be so beautiful and why you do not love but cut yourself, shaving like a blind man. I think you let me stare so you can turn against yourself with greater violence, needing to show me how you scrape the flesh away scornfully and without hesitation until I see you correctly as a man bleeding, not the reflection I desire. I got married recently, a year ago. It was a very traumatic event. Um, because I had formed a life in which I was comfortable, which I had mastered. And uh, one of its features was um, 
the recalcitrant beloved or the absent beloved or the thorny beloved and uh, I, I married someone who threatened to make me happy this was very frightening <clears throat> and uh, right before we got married um, I was really distressed and uh, he understood the source of the distress and he, he took my hand and he said well Louise you know I can't promise to make you unhappy and then he paused and then he said uh, you might try reading the newspapers anyway it's a poem that I wrote for my husband which is called for John which is his name look at my hand poor beast too frightened to be fed it holds to what it knows a whole mind can be like that like a sky ruled by the clean black of directive when the limbs are free of blossom and subterfuge there are lives sustained by negation do you know what it means to let go I think because of the state of my throat I'm going to read five more poems uh, four of which are linked naturally I'll read those four together here's the one that's not part of that series it's called Thanksgiving <coughs> they have come again to graze the orchard knowing they will be denied the leaves have fallen on the dry ground the wind makes piles of them sorting all it destroys what doesn't move the snow will cover it will give them away their hooves make patterns which the snow remembers in the cleared field they linger as the summoned prey whose part is not to forgive they can afford to die they have their place in the dying order the last thing that I'll read is the most recent thing that I've done um, some of you have already heard it uh, the poems are concerned with the myth of Eden and the sequence is called Lamentations the Logos they were both still the woman mournful the man branching into her body but God was watching they felt his gold eye projecting flowers on the landscape who knew what he wanted he was God and a monster so they waited and the world filled with his radiance as though he wanted to be understood far away in the void that he had shaped he turned to his angels nocturne a forest rose from the earth oh pitiful so needing God's furious love together they were beasts they lay in the fixed dusk of his negligence 
from the hills, wolves came, mechanically drawn to their human warmth, their panic. Then the angels saw how he divided them, the man, the woman, and the woman's body. Above the churned reeds, the leaves let go a slow moan of silver. The Covenant. Out of fear, they built a dwelling place, but a child grew between them as they slept, as they tried to feed themselves. They set it on a pile of leaves, the small discarded body wrapped in the clean skin of an animal. Against the black sky, they saw the massive argument of light. Sometimes it woke. As it reached its hands, they understood they were the mother and father. There was no authority above them. The clearing. Gradually, over many years, the fur disappeared from their bodies until they stood in the bright light, strange to one another. Nothing was as before. Their hands trembled, seeking the familiar. Nor could they keep their eyes from the white flesh on which wounds would show clearly, like words on a page. And from the meaningless browns and greens, at last God arose, his great shadow darkening the sleeping bodies of his children and leapt into heaven. How beautiful it must have been, the earth that first time seen from the air. Thank you.